My father used to love being a jeepney driver, especially when my mom accompanied him. Mom worked as a sales lady in one of the local boutiques, but when she was about to give birth, decided to accompany my dad whenever and wherever he drove. She would sit in the front seat and collect the fare from passengers. This was a good arrangement, and if needed, dad would be able to easily drive her to the nearest hospital. During the time, there were many researchers visiting the Tarzier Foundation, so there was a need for transportation. Dad was hesitant to let mom accompany him late at night, and he wasn't the only one. My Lola insisted that she stay home too. Ay nako, mabdos man ka, magpuyo diri sa balay, Lola would say. Ma, I'll be alright. I'll just sit in the front seat with Adrian, no problem, mom assured her. Naita o nagsuroy na diri maayo para ni mo, Lola argued. Who? Ay basta. My Lola believed in folk tales and old superstitions. She would give up after a few minutes of arguing, but not before giving my mom something to carry around. Sometimes she would hand her a crab shell, sometimes a plastic bag full of garlic, and on that particular day, a bottle of salt. Why is Mama asking you to carry that? Dad asked as passengers boarded the jeepney. I don't know. But she insists I carry it. They didn't understand until one fateful night, when they encountered something that neither of them could explain. One day, my dad was hired by a group of tourists to be their personal jeepney driver for the day. Their offer was beyond what was normally earned in a day, so he didn't hesitate to accept the job. Mom was just as excited as Dad was, since they would be driving through various countryside roads and local touristy spots. She'd be their tour guide during the ride. Do you think we can see the Tarsiers? One of the tourists asked. Yes, we'll be passing by the Tarsier Foundation soon. During the day, it was a beauty to behold, but at night, it was so dark and scary. It felt like someone was watching them from the woods. They escorted the passengers wherever they wanted. And slowly, it got darker. Until it was nightfall. So they drove them to their hotel and headed back home. But when they approached the main road, there was a blockage and several construction workers. Apparently, they were starting repairs and wouldn't be done until dawn. But this road leads straight to where we live. Pasensya kayo, one of the workers said. There was no point in getting mad. Dad tried to think of another possible route. What about the route we passed earlier? The one by the forest? My dad was nervous. He didn't want her to know how that particular one scared him at night. He asked the workers if there were any roads that were open, but they apologized and said no. Adrian, let's just go back the way we came. I'm sleepy. He let out a sigh and after a few minutes, agreed. Dad turned the jeepney around and drove towards the route by the forest. It was completely dark, save for a few street lamps that were flickering along the road. Dad turned the high beams on and drove as carefully as possible. There was an eerie silence. This is nice, Mom said as she relaxed in her seat. We don't usually go home by ourselves. She could sense that he was anxious. I'll just sleep. She closed her eyes and fell asleep shortly after. My dad had to be calm since he was driving with his very pregnant wife. He took deep breaths and carefully drove along the road, humming a tune to pass the time. He tried to focus while ignoring all the sounds around him. It seemed like it was going to be a quiet drive when... His heart jumped out of his chest as he heard a very odd scratching sound coming from the roof of the jeepney. He stopped the vehicle for a bit and stuck his head out to see what it was. Nothing. That's very odd, 
he thought, then continued to drive. Perhaps it was a branch. He focused on the road while listening to my mom sleep. The sooner they got home, the better. He continued to drive through the dark road when my mom moaned and groaned as if she were having a nightmare. Jer, o que iracadia? He asked. When she didn't reply, he asked again. Are you having a nightmare? Again, no response. He slowly turned to see what was wrong and gasped. There was a long, thin black tube piercing mom's stomach. It looked like liquid was seeping out of the hole, and she tossed and turned while still asleep. What was the black tube? When he reached out and touched it, it was fleshy and wet. It was slimy and something was going through it. It took a few seconds for him to realize that this tube was sucking something out of mom's stomach. Or specifically, someone. My dad immediately grabbed the tube and pulled it out of her stomach. There was an open wound. Blood slowly seeped out, so he sped to the hospital. The tube slithered back into the hole through the jeepney roof. And suddenly, there was a flapping sound coming from behind. He looked at the side mirrors to see what it was and saw a horrifying creature flying towards them. It looked like a woman with long stringy black hair and blood red eyes. She wore a tattered blouse and had no legs. She had long claws and large bat-like wings. Her mouth had large fangs and a black tube sticking out of it. It was her tongue. The creature flew towards them. Then it let out a screech as it increased its speed. Mom needed to be rushed to the hospital. It was the only thing Dad could think about. But then, the creature broke through the back of the jeepney, glass shattered everywhere. Suddenly, the adrenaline rush kicked in and he remembered the salt. Before the creature could insert its tongue into Mom again, Dad grabbed the bottle of salt from Mom's purse and sprinkled it on its tongue. Immediately, the creature started to screech again, but miraculously flew out of the vehicle. He didn't look back or listen. Mom was still fast asleep and clearly in pain. He continued speeding to the nearest hospital. As soon as they reached the main road, the screeches stopped. The creature was gone. But mom was slowly bleeding out. When they got to the hospital, she was wheeled into the emergency room to have a C-section. Fortunately, the baby wasn't harmed. She was born prematurely, but otherwise healthy. While mom rested, dad tried to understand what just happened. Hi, Nako. Thank you, Lord. My Lola arrived. He told her about the creature. And as soon as he finished, she said that the creature they encountered was an abat, also known as a manananggal. A creature that takes the form of a woman with a hunger for unborn children and organs. Every night, she detaches from her lower half, sprouts bat wings, and flies around in search of pregnant women. She would then lower her long black tongue and pierce through the pregnant woman's stomach to eat the unborn baby. From that day on, they made it a point to go home before 6 p.m. Mom stayed home with the baby and before leaving the house, carried salt and garlic. They were afraid of seeing that creature again. Some days, Dad swore he could still hear the screeching and flapping of wings while driving. And sometimes, he still hears scratching on the roof of his jeepney. I haven't gone back to my homeland in over two decades. I miss the food, the culture, 
the people. Well, all except one. My best and worst childhood memories took place in Okinawa, an island in Japan famous for its beaches. Recently, I received a call from my older cousin Akito, telling me my aunt had Alzheimer's, but randomly remembered and asked to see me. I hadn't seen my aunt since I was a teenager, when she was still able to travel and visit us in the US. Enough time had passed, and I'm an adult now. I was ready to go back. Akito picked me up from the airport, and on the ride to his mom's house, we reminisced about what happened over 20 years ago when Sora was taken from us, and they almost lost me too. Sora was my cousin and best friend. She was basically a twin sister to me, being born on the same day. When we were nine, Sora and I were playing outside her house at our favorite spot under the trees with perfect shade. It was a hot afternoon, and my aunt left to run some errands, but would be back that evening. Sora brought out a box full of colorful threads, and we spent the afternoon sitting on the grass, making each other bracelets. I felt something was off. Sora mentioned she felt the same strange feeling too, like someone was watching us. We went inside the house to check if her mom had arrived, but she didn't. When we went back outside to clean up, we heard a deep, masculine voice. At first, we thought it was her older brother Akito messing with us, but then remembered that he was accompanying his dad on a business trip. Sora was brave. She went near the tall trees where the noise came from. I followed her, holding her hand as we peeked behind them to see who was hiding. And that's when we saw a white, tall figure quickly shift. The sight brought chills to my bones. Then we heard the noise again. I followed Sora, tightening my grip and looked up, almost breaking my neck. A lady about eight feet tall was smiling down at us. She had long black hair and wore a white dress with a white sun hat. She was grinning from ear to ear. The lady quickly vanished when Sora's mom came home and found us. Her mom wondered why we looked so pale, but we didn't bring up what we saw in fear of her blaming our overactive imaginations. My mom picked me up, and I still heard the rhythmic deep sounds. Sometimes, I'd catch a glimpse of her peeping through the window at night, making that dreadful sound, then disappearing as if we were playing a game of peekaboo. Whenever I was accompanied by an adult, she'd leave me alone. Sora also reported hearing the strange sounds too, particularly at night. She also overheard her mother's voice calling from outside her window, but she was sleeping with her mom due to nightmares. When she turned around, her mom was fast asleep. Sora and I didn't see each other again. We both became very ill. My parents wondered why I had been acting strange. So, I told them the truth about what we had witnessed. I was afraid that they wouldn't believe me, but when my father learned that we had seen an eight-foot-tall woman, he demanded I tell him more. My mother exclaimed that Sora and I had been marked by the Hachishakusama, the eight-foot-tall woman of Japan. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she explained how the evil spirit preys on the children she likes, causing them to perish. She was once a very tall woman that was bullied because of her height. Children would throw stones at her, insult her, and laugh. Until one day, she tripped and fell. Her head collided with a large stone and killed her. Prior to her death though, she spoke of revenge on the children. It was at this point, as if on cue, that I heard the noise again. <coughs> but my parents didn't hear anything. I should have told them sooner. I was concerned about Sora, so I urged my father to inform her mother. He called them right away with a plan to get us out of town, but my aunt didn't believe in the legend and wanted to wait for her husband and son's return. My father advised me to stay in my room at night and not answer, leave, or let anyone in until morning. 
He told me that the Hachishaku-sama would be able to take on anyone's identity and trick me. We prayed non-stop to our ancestors for help. My mother set up an altar and put bowls of salt all over my room. She gave me an amulet called an omamori with a prayer inside and warned me that if the silk cover is open, the protective power would be lost. Thus, I shouldn't open it under any circumstances. I was getting weaker, with body aches and high fever. So mom left to get some medicine and dad stayed home from work to watch me. I was so sleep deprived, so I closed my eyes to take a nap. A frightening smile greeted me when I opened my eyes. The fabric covering of the amulet was open, and I saw the altar shaking. I was so scared and unwell that I lost consciousness. When I woke up again, it was almost morning. Sora was in my room, smiling at me. Her eyes were dark and puffy, like she hadn't gotten any sleep either. Her lips were pale and parched. She said she missed me and wanted to play at our favorite spot again. Since I missed her so much, I got up and hugged her. But I heard a loud knock on the front door. The knock was so intense that my father opened it quickly. It was my aunt begging for help. Sora was missing. I was confused. I told them that Sora was in my room. But when we looked, she had disappeared. My mother arrived. Carrying a bag of medicine, she noticed that the altar was moved and its contents were on the floor. The salt had turned black. She looked at the amulet and saw that it was open. <coughs> Instead of being scared, I was determined to look for Sora. I had a feeling that she would be in their backyard, so I asked to go there. My parents were hesitant at first, but when I persisted, we went together. My father carried me on his back. The sound was getting louder and louder as we approached their house, and indeed, it was coming from the backyard, from the trees where Sora and I saw the eight-foot-tall lady. I slowly looked up, only to see the woman behind a tree again, looking straight into my eyes as if she were teasing me. Blood dripped from her lips. She was holding a bloody leg and without breaking eye contact, bit a huge chunk of the flesh. I screamed, not because of fear, but because of anger. I swear, if my father wasn't carrying me, I would have run straight to that giant monstrosity and given her the beating of a lifetime. It seemed like I was the only one who witnessed all of this because everyone else was busy looking for Sora. Only I could see the Hachishaku-sama. Then a sudden gust of wind unveiled something hanging from one of the tree branches. It was Sora. Her mother fell on her knees and broke into tears as she saw her lifeless daughter. Her tongue was out and her skin was already purple. To everyone's horror, one of her legs was missing. My father quickly removed her from the tree and wrapped her in a blanket while my mother called an ambulance. I sobbed while hugging her. I could feel her blood trickling onto my skin. I held her hand tight and realized something was there. She was clinging onto the finished bracelet she made for me. I felt weak and blacked out. I was crying now as Akito held my hand. I missed Sora so much and stared at the bracelet around my wrist. I would do anything to see her again. I didn't even get to say goodbye or attend her funeral. My parents were so worried for me following the incident, so they booked a flight for my mom and me to stay with family in the US. My dad would eventually follow us. It was raining heavily now. I asked Akito how much longer till we arrived. I wanted to stop by Sora's grave. He went silent, stopped the car, then faced me. He was grinning from ear to ear. His dull eyes started to change into pure hatred. I tried to get out of the car. He smiled so eerily. That smile reminded me of something. The feeling of dread. I gasped. He opened his mouth. Pain, 
My friends tried to warn me. I wish I had listened. Following graduation, I hiked the entire Appalachian Trail. It was a lifelong goal of mine. Yeah, walking more than 2,000 miles sounds insane. My friends told me that it wouldn't be safe, that I could get hurt or die, and no one would know what happened to me. I knew it would take months, that I'd be putting my life at risk, but I also knew that if I hadn't done it then, then I never would have. It took months of planning, finding the right gear, shoes, clothes, sacks, a sleeping bag, stove, and canisters. And of course, protection. My plan was to enjoy the adventure and take my time. I averaged around 20 miles a day by foot. Every four days, I would stop at a small town and treat myself to a hostel and burger. But most nights, I'd camp out under the stars and eat a lot of tuna packets and nuts. Being a young woman all alone was definitely scary at times. I tried not to stray too far into rural areas and kept note of my location at all times. There were campsites along the way that helped me not feel so alienated. I made some friends here and there and learned a lot about myself. And I met Pete. He was so worldly and charming. Originally from Scotland, one of his dreams was to hike the Appalachian Trail too. He had family back in North Carolina. His ancestors were some of the first Scottish settlers to emigrate to North Carolina in the 18th century. Things escalated rather quickly between us, but when you're in the middle of nowhere, with death watching your every move, it's fate when you randomly come across another human being. And it was nice to have a buddy. After months of traveling by foot, we were nearing the end of the Appalachian Trail. We were somewhere in New England along the Berkshires in Massachusetts. We set up camp one evening, and Pete and I headed to bed like we usually did when the sun set. In the middle of the night, we woke up to heavy rain. It was odd because there wasn't a single cloud in the sky during the day, but I learned that you can never really trust Mother Nature. Then, in the far distance, we heard screams. It sounded like a woman and baby crying. Maybe someone's hurt. Pete tried to calm me down and told me to ignore the sounds. That it was just a wild animal. And that we shouldn't leave the tent. So we fell back asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I turned around. Pete was gone. Maybe he left early to look for breakfast. So I closed my eyes and fell back asleep. I woke up an hour later. Still no sign of Pete. I started to worry and remembered last night. The screams and sudden storm. I looked all around, calling out for him with zero luck. So I contacted the National Park Service 24-hour dispatch communication center and filed a missing persons report. I waited a day. They couldn't find him. What made it even more bizarre was that there was no sign of struggle in the campsite. No scratches. No footprints. It simply looked like Pete got up in the middle of the night and left. I tried to come up with a logical explanation. Maybe this was Pete's way of breaking up with me. The park ranger tried to urge me to remain calm and that they'd keep looking for Pete. I promised myself that I would finish the trail. The plan was to continue in the morning. I couldn't sleep that night, so before leaving, I decided to hike up a summit to catch the sunrise. Big mistake. Never walk around at night, especially by yourself. It was around 4am and I had my handy dandy headlamp guiding me. But of course, the batteries died. It was pitch black. I was fumbling around in my back, trying to find my spare batteries when I heard footsteps. Pete? Absolute silence. No crickets, no birds. The noisy critters went silent. Just footsteps. Believe me, I've done my research and heard crazy stories from other hikers. But generally, when you hear anything strange when you're in the middle of nowhere, ignore it. Don't walk towards it. Don't be curious. It didn't happen. Remain calm and carry on. Well, easier said than done, my heart was racing. 
I finally found some spare batteries and debated whether or not I should continue up the summit or head back down. I looked around, trying to figure out the best path, and had to do a double take when my light caught something in the trees. It was eight feet tall. As soon as I saw its glowing eyes, I looked away. I'll never forget how it looked. It was emaciated, with its rib cage sticking out of its flesh. It looked like death, with its ash gray complexion, empty eye sockets, no lips, and yellow sharp fangs and claws. Everything about it was tattered and bloody, and the smell was like a decomposing corpse. I tried not to puke. My arms were covered in goosebumps. I knew I wasn't safe. I quickly looked away from the trees and started walking away from the sound. When I stepped on something, I looked down. It was Pete's sneaker. That's when I started hearing distant screams as if a man was crying for help. Chia! Help! Pete? No, it couldn't be. It sounded like Pete, except it was like a deep, hoarse growl. It went silent again. Don't acknowledge it. It doesn't exist. I kept reminding myself, it's not him. I wanted to run towards the sound, but my body's reaction told me otherwise. It was like a feeling unlike any other I'd ever felt. I felt like I was being stalked, like I was someone or something's prey. Slowly, I quietly walked away, trying not to make a big deal out of it, and to walk with intention. I kept my arms by my side. I didn't make any sudden movements because I knew I could never outrun whatever it was. And I prayed as hard as I could. Gia! The voice echoed across the dark forest and I couldn't resist any longer. I looked back and saw the creature again, staring at me. This time it was eating something. Or rather, someone with red hair. Pete? I watched as blood slowly trickled down its face and fangs. Pete's body was decapitated and completely shredded from its sharp claws. It licked its lips and growled in satisfaction. I screamed and immediately ran away as fast as I could. All I could hear was the sound of footsteps coming from behind me, but I refused to look back again. The footsteps were getting louder and closer. Then my arm was grabbed. Before I could scream, a hand was placed over my mouth. I turned around. Shh, don't say a word. It's not safe here. Follow me. He led me down the summit, and when I looked up at the sky, realized that the sun was rising. You're safe now. You shouldn't wander around when it's dark. I'm Achak. Thanks for the help. I'm Gia. What was that thing? An evil creature. A malevolent, cannibalistic being. Wait, do you mean a when? Never say its name. Sorry. I thanked Achak and offered him breakfast. We talked a bit more and I learned a lot. I learned that I was on sacred but stolen land. So the creature wanted to scare me off or kill me. I told him about Pete. Achak had a very solemn look on his face but didn't say anything. Do you think? Maybe. Just count your blessings because you're alive. I couldn't help but cry for a moment. When it was time to part ways, Achak told me that I wouldn't be safe. You might think I'm crazy for still wanting to do this, but now I feel like I really need to. Not just for me, but also for Pete, if he really is gone. And I have friends waiting for me. Then I'll accompany you. You really don't need to. I insist. And no one knows these areas better than I do. Besides, I have family up in Maine that I should visit. So we headed out the next day. And Achak really did know what he was doing. He came prepared. Salt, silver, sage, and a large caliber rifle. In case we came across the creature again. 
He led the way while teaching me about his people and the different legends. He taught me how to properly fish and hunt for food, and how to kill the creature with silver and fire. I felt safe, like I was no longer being watched. He also made sure I was never out late at night, and that a fire was always burning. We finally reached Mount Katahdin, Maine's highest peak, which marked the end of the Appalachian Trail. We hiked up the summit, and it was exhausting, but well worth it. Because I did it. More than 2,000 miles and about half a year later, while meeting some pretty remarkable people along the way, and even coming close to death. Life has never been the same. I really did learn some valuable lessons, like how you should always respect the land you walk on. You never know who or what is watching. Come on, Ree. Please! I sighed for what felt like the hundredth time and opened my door. Her pouting face and red cheeks were nothing new to witness whenever she wanted something. I already told you no, Joe. Why not? Cause I'm gonna spend Mardi Gras with my friends tomorrow and I don't want my little sister crashing my style. It irritated me how she always got what she wanted whenever she pulled the crocodile tears. I was determined not to fall for it anymore. But you never want to play with me anymore. Don't you like me? I had to get her off my back in a way I knew only an eight-year-old would fall for. You really want to come out with me tomorrow? She nodded. The only way for you to do so is if you pass the big kid challenge. Big kid challenge? Normally we'd have to wait until you're a little older. But if you're that insistent on hanging out with the big kids, then I guess I can let you take the challenge a little early. That is, if you're up for it. What do I do? I led her to the bathroom. The candy man? That's right. Take a seat and I'll explain. We sat on the floor facing each other. I remember putting on a deep, mysterious voice like they do in the movies. Prepare yourself, Joe. This will determine if you can be considered a big kid. Joe gulped. According to legend, if you chant Candyman five times in front of a mirror, He'll appear behind you. But who is he? The legend dates back to the 1800s. The Candyman was the son of a slave who grew up on a plantation. One day, a wealthy landowner wanted him to paint his daughter. However, the landowner didn't realize that the Candyman and his daughter would eventually fall in love. When the girl's dad found out, he was mad. He organized a lynch mob to hunt down the Candyman and kill him, because he was a black man. You see, back then in America, slavery was still very much a thing. There was so much hatred and racism, and poor Candyman fell victim to it. He tried to run, but eventually they cornered him in a barn and cut off his right hand with a large blade. Joe was trembling now. However, it doesn't end there, Joe. They smeared his body with honey and watched as bees stung him to death, then burned his body into ashes and scattered them. But as you know, he isn't really gone. Evil racists turned him into a spirit hungry for vengeance, and now summoning him through a mirror gives him the power to kill. What does he look like? The Candyman is a tall man who wears a brown fur trench coat and leather shoes. Remember the hand he lost? Now he has a bloody hook that he uses to gut his victims. But that's not all. The trench coat he wears, he uses it to cover his gross skinless rib cage, where he keeps a huge nest of bees. After he died, he rose from the grave and became a vengeful spirit that torments anyone who dares question his existence. And now, it's time for you to do the Big Kid Challenge. What? What do I have to do? You have to summon the Candyman by calling out his name five times. Her eyes widened, and look into the mirror. Do this, and you can come with me. Unless you can't. I'm not afraid. I'll do it. Okay, I'll stand back here and watch. I watched as she closed her eyes and began to say Candyman five times. Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. 
She then opened her eyes and waited. Nothing happened until the lights turned off. Then a hand grabbed her shoulder and a voice leaned in. Boo! She screamed so loud it echoed off the walls and ran out of the bathroom straight into the kitchen to mom and dad. She started crying hysterically. I tried to calm her down saying that it was only a game. But the red eyes... Huh? After explaining the situation to my parents, I was left with two choices. Either take her out and make sure she had the best time in Mardi Gras, or stay home and be grounded. My choice was pretty obvious. However, I was under the instruction that I must never let her out of my sight, and I had to do whatever she wanted. I reluctantly agreed, and the next day, we left around noon. The festivities were booming as my sister reveled in it all. She was overjoyed despite what happened yesterday. We did everything she wanted, visited all the stalls and ate all the food. I remember feeling exhausted as she dragged me everywhere. As we rested underneath a tree, I spotted my friends. I told her I would be right back, and she grabbed my arm and whined. She frowned, but slowly let go. My friends introduced me to Mitch, who was in our class. He was so cute. We talked a lot and I felt on top of the world. When I checked the time, it was half an hour later. I swore under my breath and told my friends I had to leave. I knew Joe would be pissed. However, when I returned to the tree, she wasn't there. I walked up to a man selling cotton candy and asked him if he had seen her. I gave him a brief description and he recalled her buying cotton candy, then waiting under the tree with a frown on her face. I felt extremely guilty, but what he said next made my blood run cold. Just before I came, she took off running. I asked him which way she went, and he pointed down the street. How could I be so stupid? I allowed myself to be sidetracked and now my little sister was missing. I knew mom and dad would be furious when they found out, but I didn't care. I just wanted to find her. I ran and screamed out her name, but nothing. The sun had already set now and the streetlights were coming on. My legs were on fire, but I wasn't ready to give up. From the corner of my eye, I managed to see bright pink quickly shifting from my vision. I realized it was Jo. She was running away from the main street with a speed I didn't know a small eight-year-old could possess. I darted off after her, screaming for her to wait. She didn't hear me. The festivities were growing louder, and there were a lot more adults out. I tried my best to push and squeeze my way through the crowds. I kept my eyes solely on my sister. Because of all the bodies blocking my way, she gained some more distance and I was afraid I'd lose her again. Joe was gradually running away from the festivities towards a less populated area, making it easier for me to see her, but still ignoring me. Then she bolted inside of an old public bathroom. I didn't hesitate for a second when entering. But just as I was about to open the door, a loud scream pierced my ears. I froze as I gripped the door handle. Part of me wanted to let go and run as I instantly recognized her scream. I took a moment to steady my breath and went inside. The smell was awful. It was as if no one cleaned the bathroom in years. I had to pinch my nose. The lights were flickering, buzzing loudly. Joe? No response. With a shaky breath, I slowly approached the stalls. There were four of them, all closed. One by one, I opened them, cringing by the creaking of the door. She wasn't in any of the first three, but when I got to the last one, my heart pounded so loudly, I thought it was gonna burst. The door popped open from the other side. Bees flew out and surrounded me as I screamed and fell back. I swiped and kicked away as I cried, feeling my pants get warm and wet. Then suddenly, the bees scattered and disappeared. I opened my eyes and gasped in horror. A large man wearing a long furry trench coat was towering over me with a smile on his face. I covered my mouth as I stared at his chest. It was skinless and mutilated, with nothing hiding the disgusting flesh and bees. He raised his right arm up. I stared at the large hook. You're real? Ah, so you know who I am. Worry not, child. I have not come for you. 
He walked towards me and smiled so sinisterly. I backed up even further, ignoring the pain in the back of my head as I hit the sink. I have come to thank you. What? Yes, for I have been waiting for a naive soul to bring me back. He slowly caressed his hook against my cheek, then raised my head up, examining me. To be so young and irresponsible, absolutely marvelous. He stood up and covered his chest. Farewell, I do hope to see you again soon. He chuckled darkly. <laughs> oh, and do mind your sister in there. She had quite the experience. And with that, he walked out the door and out into the night. I don't know how long it took for me to compose myself, but the moment I did, I slowly walked up to the stall and opened it. The last thing I remember was screaming my lungs out as I collapsed to the floor in a pool of my own sister's blood.